Okay, good evening everyone and welcome back to the Institute for Northern Studies Public Seminar Series 2022-23. to It's lovely to see so many familiar faces in the audience tonight and uh, and yeah, welcome back to the second instalment of this term series. For you, those who might not know me, my name is Dr. Andrew Lind. I am a lecturer here at the Institute for Northern Studies and it's my great pleasure to be chairing these sessions. Now, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I have my usual mantra of technical information, which I'm honour bound to repeat tonight. So apologies for those who attend uh, every one of these seminars. They've probably heard this far too many times, but it's a nice little tradition that we have now. So firstly, I just need to make everyone aware that we are recording tonight's session. So if you want to relive the entire event in its, uh, in its full splendour, you can do so over on the Institute for Northern Studies YouTube channel. The second and final point that I need to make before we get underway is that if you have any questions for our speaker tonight, please do send them in and we would ask that you submit those questions via the chat function on your screen. So if you could ignore the Q&A button uh, and just put it in the chat function and make sure that you address those questions to all panellists. And that just means that we can all keep an eye on the questions and nothing falls through the gaps. Now, one of the, the many benefits of organising these seminars is that I occasionally get the opportunity to invite some of my pals to come along to talk about their research. So in that spirit, it's my great pleasure tonight to welcome Dr. Graham Millen to the Institute for Northern Studies. Dr. Millen is an early career researcher who recently graduated from the University of Kent Centre for Medieval and Early Modern Studies. His thesis critically reappraised the Highland War and was entitled The Scots-Dutch Brigade in the Highland War 1689-1691. to He's currently employed as a tutor in Scottish and British history at the University of St Andrews and as an associate member of staff at the University of Dundee. Alongside this, he's currently working on several publications based on his doctoral research and seeks to expand beyond these parameters to examine the Scottish Army on the eve of the Union. Tonight, Graham will be sharing some of this research with us in his paper, which is evocatively titled The End of the Highland War? Question mark. The Scots-Dutch Brigade and the Fort William Expedition 1690. Very warm welcome to you, Graham. Thanks very much, Andrew, and thanks uh, for inviting me. I can't think of a better institute or university for this subject. Um, so can everyone see this screen? Is that OK? Yep. Yep, that's you. You're grand. Excellent, excellent. Right, so um, hopefully I can answer that question, the end of the Highland War, the Scots Touch Brigade and the Fort William Expedition. So tonight I'll be focusing on an aspect of the conflict or the first Jacobite rising, as it's sometimes better known, that has been somewhat neglected within the historiography. And that neglect is partially down to the protracted nature of the campaign itself, alongside a lack of a significant battle to punctuate it, and as well as historians of various stripes, ranging from the politics of the revolution and the rise of the British fiscal military state to the Jacobite movement, who understandably don't have room for this kind of a sort of incisive look at a couple of months of campaigning in their broader studies. So, this paper comes from the penultimate chapter of my doctoral thesis, which Andrew helpfully entitled. And I'm currently in the process of expanding these chapters into published works, either articles, magazine articles, journal articles, edited chapters, that kind of thing. But before we delve into the campaign itself, I'd like to just first set the scene and foreground what led us to this point in the Highland War. So, oh, there we go. So, the Highland War, which lasted from 1689 to 1691, might at first glance appear to be an entirely insular topic, a conflict which mostly was confined to Scotland and to the areas of Gaeldom within Scotland. Albeit there are forays into the lowlands by the Jacobites, particularly Perth, which Bonnie Dundee raids twice in 1689, mainly around the areas of uh, Invernessshire and what was called Aberdeenshire at the time, and um, some fighting in Edinburgh with the Siege of Edinburgh Castle, which will kind of go over the chronology of the conflict leading up to that point. But 
This conflict, the, the Highland War has its origins much further afield than Scotland. It didn't arise just out of domestic issues or politics. Um, mainly, it comes out of this event in England and the events in Europe, which led to it, the glorious, so-called glorious revolution of 1688. And of course, on the 5th of November, 1688, a Dutch army landed upon the shores of Tor Bay in Devon. Prince Willem Hendrik of Orange, Stadtholder of the Dutch Republic, led this, this army of 14,000 men uh, into his father-in-law's kingdom, James VII and II. Now, James VII and II had become increasingly close with the French King Louis XIV in the decade prior to this landing. And on the eve of a new European conflict, what would become known as the Nine Years' War or the War of the Grand Alliance, lasting from 1688 to 1697, the Dutch prince and his government intervened in England in order to prevent an alliance between the three kingdoms of the Stuarts and the French king. As had occurred uh, earlier in the reign of Charles II during the first half of the Franco-Dutch War and the Third Anglo-Dutch War, which is it's a, I think it's the 350th anniversary of that in the Netherlands. They know it as the ramp yard or disaster gear. Um, so they're very keen to avoid that disaster happening again, hence this massive invasion. Now, James openly professed uh, Catholicism was not a popular fact about him. That's pretty well known. Um, the birth of a male heir James Francis Edward Stuart in June of 1688 would mean that domestic discontent against him increased, particularly in England and Scotland, not so much in Ireland for obvious reasons. But that domestic discontent was fueled by English and Scottish exiles operating in the Netherlands in close cooperation with the Dutch government. And they would play a key role in the invasion and in the case of the Scots in particular, in the upcoming Highland War. At the head of the Dutch army entering England were also British officers of the Anglo-Dutch and Scots-Dutch brigades, led by Major General Hugh Mackay of Scouring, who we'll return to shortly. The Scots-Dutch brigade had been a long-standing feature of the armies of the Dutch States General, having been established in 1572, they are generally three regiments of foot. They tend to be a type of elite infantry, sort of like the Swiss Guard. Um, and they were once famously described as the bulwark of the Republic by Prince Maurice of Nassau in the early half of the 17th century. So these guys are pretty well renowned and no pushovers. And their involvement in the invasion of England is critical, although understudied and more work remains to be done about their role and their movements in England. But anyway, the revolution in England would lead to the downfall of King James, helped in no small part by this large Dutch army we see here. And James would then flee into exile with his family in France in December of 1688. James was declared rather conveniently to have abdicated the throne when he chucked the English Privy Seal into the River Thames. In Ireland and Scotland, however, matters were not to be resolved so swiftly nor so simply. In the former country, James could rely upon the support of the sizable Catholic population there, and several key noblemen and army officers had already begun raising the Irish Jacobite army towards the late end of 1688 and the early months of 1689. However, in the latter country, James's remnant Scottish regime collapsed into a power vacuum as it struggled to maintain, maintain control in the face of localised discontent and the absence of a standing army to reassert control over the country. The bulk of the Royal Scots Army, I must say, was called into England in September 1688 and was subsequently disbanded at the disastrous events of Salisbury Plain in November of that same year. So there's only small forces left in Edinburgh and a couple of garrison troops who tend to be older soldiers and younger men, not really the type of troops you'd want to take into the field. Anyway, so this um, lack of control was a ripe opportunity for James's political opponents, 
and for William's Scottish supporters. In December of 1688, a delegation of Scottish lords, such as Archibald Campbell, the 10th Earl of Argyll, and William Hamilton, the 3rd Duke of Hamilton, requested that the Prince of Orange act as administrator of Scottish affairs. Now, this gave William caretaker powers until the matter of the Scottish succession could be resolved in the absence of King James. And I have to say this is presented from two different perspectives here, from a Williamite perspective, so to speak, um, and we'll kind of lump William supporters all together here because a civil war is always devolves into two sides. There's a lot of different factions supporting William and Mary for all sorts of reasons in Scotland, but we'll not get too much into that. Um, for obvious reasons, the Williamites view this as an interregnum. This is, there's no king and we have to decide who succeeds to the throne. For the Jacobite perspective, they would view this as a usurpation and an illegal act. However, William obviously heartily agreed to the proposal and to the Williamites' next request, permission to hold a convention of estates, which, who, which could decide who would set the throne. Now, a convention is a... Uh, it's basically a parliament that's not a parliament. The parliament can't sit in Scotland without the permission of the monarch. When that happens, the Convention of Estates is a very useful constitutional device to basically resolve these types of crises. So the convention began their meetings on the 14th of March, 1689, and within less than a week had decided to depose King James VII, citing his arbitrary style of government and his, quote, popish tyranny. The Scottish Williamites had then politically outmaneuvered the Jacobites. They had gained control of the levers of government. So game, set, match, you might think, but no. The Williamites had only gained de jure control of the levers of political power in Edinburgh. A significant minority of die-hard loyalists within the Jacobite party in Scotland were not willing to let the matter lie so easily. On the 18th of March, 1689, almost, uh, I think, just a day after that vote, John Graham of Claverhouse, first Viscount of Dundee, departed the convention and the city of Edinburgh with a small retinue of 50 army officers in tow. Now, Dundee argued that he was only returning to his estates, which he would eventually within the coming days, but not before meeting with the openly defiant governor of Edinburgh Castle to encourage him to resist the convention and reportedly to promise to return with an army at his back. From where? That was the question. But this put the wind up the convention in Edinburgh and the new interim government that was forming there. They declared Dundee a traitor to the free and lawful estates and summoned him to face the charge on the 27th of 1689. He refused. And after raising the Jacobite banner on Dundee law, he then fled to the Highlands, where he had been corresponding with several Gallic chieftains who had promised him support and were sympathetic to the cause of King James, namely men like Sir Ewan Cameron of Lochiel. Now, they set about raising quite rapidly a Scottish Jacobite army, and the capacity of the Highlands to rapidly raise levies in this period was well known to contemporaries. The Scottish Williamite government now faced an armed challenge without a standing army to defend itself. And so too did, by extension, William of Orange's revolution in England, because if you don't secure Scotland, then you cannot secure uh, political matters in England. Scotland is England's northern flank, as the Covenanters demonstrated in the 1640s by taking over Newcastle numerous times. So we've set the scene for this new Scottish civil war. On the same day that Dundee refused to return to Edinburgh, um, he noted in his response to the convention, he sent them a very sort of cheeky letter back, um, that the arrival of men of war, that is ships of war, on the Firth of Forth uh, had just occurred. And on board those ships were reportedly foreign troops. And Dundee said he would not return to the capital until he knew their purpose and who they were for. Now, these were the men of the Scots Dutch Brigade, so he's very right to be wary. 1,500 soldiers split into three regiments were commanded, or sorry, 1,100 soldiers uh, were split into three regiments commanded by 
Major General Hugh Mackay, who as Colonel of the 1st Regiment was also commander of the brigade as a whole. Brigadier Bartold Balfour, who would later perish at Killycrankie and would be replaced by Colonel George Lauder for the 1690 campaign. And finally, Colonel George Ramsay of the Ramses of Dalhousie. These regiments landed at Leith Docks on the 28th of March en masse, and they did not come empty handed. They had arms, ammunition, artillery, and they also came with £10,000 sterling, which was not used to pay the brigade itself, but used to imburse, basically to give the convention a little bump in raising their new army, the Scottish Williamite Army. Now, William of Orange and his Dutch advisors decision to send the Scots Dutch Brigade to Scotland is of great importance because of those geopolitical factors I referred to in the security of the revolution. Jonathan Israel, the scholar of the quote unquote Anglo-Dutch moment, has quite rightfully noted that the revolution in Britain is not secured until the wars in Ireland and the wars in Scotland are over in 1691. So William had also ordered other forces into Scotland as well, such as the Royal Scots Dragoon Regiment, who were a regiment of Scots in English service since the reign of Charles II. And they were commanded by actually one of Mackay's former comrades, a part Scotsman, part Dutchman, third generation migrant, Sir Thomas Livingston. And they were also accompanied by three other English regiments who would appear within the year 1689 and would kind of serve to aid their Scottish allies. And on top of this, William, uh, William also deployed a Royal Navy frigate squadron, 16 ships in all, to patrol the Scottish western seaboard. So it really demonstrates that William's later dislike of Scottish domestic politics has sometimes coloured our perception of his disinterest in Scotland during this period. You cannot say William of Orange was not concerned with issues in Scotland during the Highland War because he was heavily involved in sending out these warrants and ordering these troops into the kingdom. And he was also involved in correspondence and making sure the war was going okay throughout it. So for their own part, the Scottish Convention met this military aid from William with open arms, quite understandably, and particularly welcomed the return of the Scots Dutch Brigade and its experienced officer corps. They began by ratifying William's warrant to Major General Mackay to command his forces in Scotland by making Mackay commander in chief of their new army. The Scots Dutch officers were then at the heart of the first war against the Jacobites and acted as a loyal corps, which while small could be relied upon for almost any task and due to their expertise could be given quite difficult tasks to complete. During the initial stages of the conflict, the Scots Dutch Brigade played a critical role in securing areas of central Scotland in the lowlands, particularly garrisons like Stirling Castle, um, which also housed a royal magazine of arms and ammunition during this period. And after a four month protracted siege against the Duke of Gordon, they took over Edinburgh Castle and finally militarily secured Edinburgh for the Williamites. Now, the brigade's military expertise provided the Scottish Williamites with this ready-made core of veterans around which they could rebuild their standing army. And with Major General Mackay in charge, the Scottish Williamites quickly began pursuing Dundee's rapidly assembling Jacobite army around the Eastern Highlands. The first stages of the conflict were indecisive, which, with much manoeuvring and counter-manoeuvring as each army tried to gain an advantage over the other. Now, the first battle of the war isn't actually Kelly Cranky, as quite a lot of people often mistakenly think. It's quite understandable because it's the most famous. The first battle took place on the Kintyre Peninsula at the Battle of Loop Hill on the 16th of May, 1689. And that was to be a Williamite victory, which secured control of the area and denied it as a landing ground for Jacobite supplies and reinforcements from Ireland. At the more famous and bloody Battle of Kelly Cranky on the 27th of July, 1689, Three battalions of the Scots Dutch Brigade, one from each regiment, would show uh, would give a mixed performance. Although the Dutch platoon firing method was deployed quite well by Mackay's first Scots Dutch Regiment on the right wing, the two other regiments on the left were not so lucky in terms of the undulating terraces which were before them and helped to shield the charging Jacobite Highlanders. <clears throat> 
And once the Highland Charge connected with these troops, the game was over. They routed down the flank of the army and left the field. Kelly Cranky was a major victory for the Jacobite army. I'm not here to defend the brigade's performance there. But it came at a great cost for the Jacobites, um, which is important to note going forward here. The death of Viscount Dundee leading the charge. Now, this was a major blow to the Jacobite cause, but it's not the end or the, uh, it's not the penultimate uh, act in the Jacobite rising, as some would say, um, particularly biographers of the great man. The loss of his leadership was certainly felt at the time, but the Scottish Jacobite army actually saw its numbers bolstered after his death rather than diminish. They went from 2,000 men strong on the eve of the battle to around 4,000 in the month after. And Brigadier Alexander Cannon took over from Dundee. Now, he was an experienced former Scots Dutch Brigade officer who'd returned for James in 1688, and he was no pushover. He also had connections to the northeast of Scotland, which could be quite helpful in getting the support of sympathetic uh, Episcopalian gentlemen. Now, Kelly Cranky was the nadir for the Scots Dutch Brigade's involvement in the Highland War, but Mackay had survived Kelly Cranky and had ensured the orderly retreat of a significant group of the Williamite army from the field, preserving with it many senior officers. And Mackay recovered from this loss rapidly. The Scottish Williamite army present at Killiecrankie, 3,500 at most, did not represent the full extent of the Williamite strength in Scotland. It was maybe closer to 6,000, 7,000 men total. By the end of 1689, the army numbers 9,000, almost 10,000 in the field. Um, but anyway, the significant forces were at Stirling. There was a detachment campaigning in and around Argyll under the eponymous Errol Lairlove, and a force garrisoned within the bounds of Aberdeenshire and Invernessshire under the command of Livingston. Now, the Wilmites quickly resumed their pursuit of the Jacobite army, but that enlarged and emboldened force was much more dangerous, and that danger was demonstrated at the Battle of Dunkeld on the 21st of August 1689. The Jacobite army assaulted the town and the Cameronian regiment, who were Presbyterian followers of the field preacher Richard Cameron, where basically they engaged in a vicious street to street battle. And with only 800 men at most, the Cameronians miraculously turned back the 4,000 strong Jacobite army, thanks in part to the urban sort of warfare aspect of this, the street to street fighting, and also their serious commitment and zeal to the cause. Um, they suffered massive losses. Uh, the Jacobites, a few losses, but not as many as the Cameronians, but the, for the Jacobites, it was a serious blow and one which shook the clan's confidence in Cannon's leadership. This would lead to Cannon being replaced by another former Scots Dutch officer in April of 1690, Major General Thomas Buchan, albeit both of those men would work very closely for the remainder of the conflict. It was almost a joint command kind of deal. Now, the remaining months of 1689, just before I move on to the 1690 campaign, devolved into a series of Jacobite raids and Williamite counter raids. Kelly Cranky and Dunkeld are hugely important battles and very interesting to study in and of themselves, but they're not the, they've been often portrayed as respective ends of the conflict. After Kelly Cranky, it was all over. After Dunkeld, it was all over. And really, they'd only ensured that there was a stalemate going forward, which would last until the resumption of campaigning in the following year. Now, the same claim has been made for the battle that opened up the 1690 campaign, the dramatic battle of Cromdale, the Hawes of Cromdale, uh, to quote the famous song. And it's important for me to briefly briefly relay what happened at the battle, as well as the political context surrounding Cromdale. So Cromdale subsequently underpins the strategic reasoning behind the Williamite offensive of 1690. Now, at the beginning of 1690, the Scottish Williamite government was in the process of resolving a political crisis within the Scottish Parliament, and with it, an attendant financial crisis. One of the Scottish parliamentary opposition's favourite tactics during this period 
is to withhold an act of supply, which is an act which funds the government, and basically use that act to bargain for further constitutional reform and also religious reform in this case, trying to, you know, hold something over the Crown. Now, the Crown sought, sought to resolve that through parliamentary management, but that process was not quick, which would mean in the winter of 1689, the Scottish Royal Might Army was pretty much forced to patrol the frontier areas, stay within their garrisons or their quarters, and try and keep their men together, um, usually by taking, usually by officers taking out uh, amounts of credit to kind of pay their men on spec and hope that the Scottish government would repay them later on. So Mackay had, um, Mackay at that time in late 1689 had actually been keen to follow up Kelly Cranky by bringing about a swift end to the Jacobite threat. And he had quite a daring and sort of bold, expensive uh, strategy to do this, to strike at the very heart of their support base in the Hebrides and in the Western Highlands, mainly Lochaber. They proposed re-establishing the Cromwellian bastion at Inverlochy, uh, which had been created during the English occupation of Scotland in the 1650s at the head of Loch Linney. And he proposed this as early as June 1689, so it was something he was floating even before the defeat at Killycrankie. But obviously, Killycrankie had shaken the Scottish government's confidence in Mackay's leadership, and the financial crisis that Mackay would have to deal with would mean even those who supported them were unable to get him the funding to carry out this offensive. By the time they were even thinking about it, it was too late. The winter months had set and you had to wait until spring of 1690. But it's interesting to kind of go into Mackay's strategic reasoning here. He felt that by planting a fort in the midst of the Jacobite Highlands, the Williamites would be better able to force the clans to submit by sort of pressuring them militarily, mainly with patrols and reprisal raids on their lands, which I'll go more into later on. Come back to Cromdale, which sadly doesn't have as good a painting as this one. Um, the Battle of Cromdale would see the Scottish Jacobite army campaign into the Northeast Lowlands to try and elicit support from those sympathetic Episcopalians we previously mentioned. Um, they were again pursued by a field army led by Major General Mackay. But this campaign came to an abrupt end when the Scottish Jacobites moved into Straths Bay and encamped on the Hawes of Cromdale because they came far too close to the Williamite garrison centre of Inverness. Now, upon hearing word that the Jacobite army were at Cromdale and a day's, head, a day's march ahead of Mackay, Sir Thomas Livingston, who was stationed at Inverness, led a detachment on a night march from the city to catch them off guard. And Livingston and his men struck in the early hours of the morning with a highly mobile force of dragoons, coupled with around a battalion of foot and an independent company of Highlanders, led by Mackay's own cousin, Hugh Mackay of Borlay, inflicting a serious surprise attack on the Jacobites and basically defeating them in the field. A good deal of the Jacobite officers were captured alongside some of the Highland and Lowland noblemen and gentlemen. Um, but the clansmen and most of the chieftains made good their escape due to the timely descent of a mist across the plains. And they retired back to their lands to regroup. But by now, they were completely losing faith in Buchan's leadership as well as Cannon's. Only a landing of an Irish army led by James Fitzjames, the Jacobite Duke of Berwick, would, they contended, compel the chieftains to gather again in the field outside of the Highlands. King James kept promising this, but events in Ireland would keep this from happening. Firstly, the siege of Derry in 1689 and the loss there, meaning they could no longer control Ulster, and then the arrival of William, with a large Dutch English army in the spring of 1690 would keep them from sending troops over. There were some Irish troops, I should know. Colonel Nicholas Purcell's regiment served for a while in 1689. They seem to have returned in 1690. And there's some small groups of Irish soldiers and officers you see crop up here or there, but not many after 1689. Now, the result of Cromdale uh, to kind of come back to that idea of an end. The result of Cromdale was not to conclude the Highland War, but to put the Scottish Jacobite army firmly on a defensive footing. 
The one right victory there would have to be cemented with an offensive on the Jacobite strongholds in the Highlands and Islands. As Mackay puts it in his memoirs, the strategic reasoning behind this was, quote, they should not be subdued without garrisons in the midst of their country, whereby they should be obliged to live summer and winter in their hills or be so exposed to the enterprises of the garrisons that at last they should be forced to obedience, end quote. So to come to the 69 campaign itself in the course of events. From May 1690, Mackay had begun preparing the Scottish Williamite forces for a significant offensive targeted at Inverlochy. In order to mount the land operation, the Williamites would need to be supplied adequately, particularly when they built the fort, which would become known as Fort William. The distance between even the nearest Williamite garrisons would make this extremely difficult over land, with lines of supply and communication stretched to their acceptable limits in this period. The major route for supplies into Inverlochy was to be via the sea. Um, but the major issue with supplying via the sea during this time uh, in May 1690 was the presence of Jacobite support and clans along the western seaboard, particularly the Inner Hebrides. Now, the islands of the Hebrides gave French privateers plenty of bases to disrupt Williamite naval supply lines and also to ferry in reinforcements and possibly arms, mostly arms and uh, money from Ireland. In preparation for the land operation, Mackay tasked a detachment of 600 choice men, mainly from the Scots Dutch Brigade, to raid Sky, Giga, Cara, Colonsey, Jura, Mull, Col, Rum and Egg. And the Marine detachment was to be commanded by a Scots Dutch comrade, Major, Gen Major James Ferguson, an old uh, apprentice of Mackay, so to speak, a young officer. And they were embarked aboard a joint squadron of these Royal Navy frigates that I mentioned earlier, and a modest Scottish Williamite flotilla commanded by Captain Edward Pottinger. And the idea was to force the clans controlling these areas to capitulate, or at the very least to deny their use to the Jacobites. Mull, for example, was important as it acted as a base for the Scottish Jacobite command and was utilised as a stronghold to hold military materiel and prisoners of war. The Williamite naval operation that was to lay the groundwork for the upcoming offensive that summer uh, was to lay the groundwork for the upcoming offensive that summer. And Pottinger's logs record the nature of these raids. Quote, upon some islands, the soldiers have left scarce a beast nor a hut to shelter them. Now, the naval operation was ultimately a success. Um, it was mostly a useful tool in harassing clans like the Macleans of Duart. And one major success came, the one major success really, came with the raid on the lands of the McDonald's of Sleep on the Isle of Skye. And here, Pottinger utilised the overwhelming artillery of his frigates to shell two houses of the clan. Um, and then this was followed by a landing by Ferguson and his men, although the Williamite Marines were driven back, suffering 20 casualties in a short skirmish. But ultimately, the McDonald's saw that the writing was on the wall with those ships anchored off the shore. The McDonald's were then forced to surrender, uh, lay down their arms and promise not to rise up in arms again, which withdrew their support from the Scottish Jacobite army as a result. And that's a prime example of the type of results these tactics were meant to produce, to overawe the clans and to force them to withdraw support and then submit to the new regime, of course. Now, these raiding tactics, I should say, were unapologetically brutal. Um, and in the instance of the naval operation, I would be remiss not to mention the raid on Egg, on the Isle of Egg, against the Roman Catholic clan of Clan Ranald. It's particularly important to note because it resulted in a little-known massacre perpetrated by the Williamite troops there. When the Williamite naval detachment came to Egg, they engaged in negotiations with the McDonald's of Clan Ranald. That ultimately, um, ultimately their, the presence of the Williamites there resulted in the death of either a soldier or a sailor, it's unclear which, and that death, although unconnected with the negotiations themselves, 
saw the Williamite troops return to the island later on and then take revenge on the island's inhabitants, reputedly at the behest of Pottinger, but likely um, overseen or acquiesced to by Ferguson. A second-hand uh, oral account of the massacre is all we have. It was printed in the 1760s, and it records that soldiers clad with red coats and some with white coats and grenadier caps, armed with sword and pike, used all acts of hostility as killing, burning, turtling, and deforcing of women." End quote. When Clan, La La uh, when Clan Ranald would later bring this case before the Scottish Government and the Royal Navy's Admiralty, Admiralty Board, Pottinger would deny any knowledge of the massacre, and his logs, unsurprisingly, did not contain any information pertaining to these events. It is unlikely that Pottinger nor Ferguson would have incriminated themselves by committing these abhorrent actions to paper, never mind committing the nature of their involvement in them to paper, willing or otherwise. More evidence is hard to come by, as Pottinger would die in a storm in October of that year, the rumour being that he had incurred the wrath of Highland witches due to his wicked actions during his naval campaigns, that myth perhaps indicating the nature of his treatment of the locals during these expeditions. Corroborative evidence for the massacre taking place might be found not within the records because it's very hard to come by these types of sources, particularly when you're dealing with something like this, but in the deployment of similar reprisal tactics by the Scottish Williamite Army following the Williamite Offensive, albeit Mackay tended to utilise more calculated and targeted violence against combatants and their lands and their property rather than non-combatants as per the rules of war, which is a thing during this period. Um, that he's still attacking people's property, particularly cattle, could mean death for people who are subsistence farmers. Living in the shillings is obviously not easy. And Mackay knew that and exerting military pressure to coerce the clans to come in and to make life harder for those civilian populations was the goal here, ultimately. You could also find corroborative evidence for this, perhaps, in the massacre of Glencoe in February 1692, which followed the conclusion of the Highland War. It comes after the conflict has ended. Regardless, to move on, these amphibious operations were merely the prelude to the land defensive of that year. By June of 1690, Mackay had begun gathering an army in Stirling and in the surrounding areas near Edinburgh to mount an offensive into the Western Highlands overland. Now, Mackay understood the Highlands well, excuse me, as he was, after all, the third son of a branch of the clan Mackay and hailed from Scouring in the parish of Edgekillis in northwest Sutherland. Now, I'll not get too much into Mackay's complex and layered identity today. I've covered this in previous papers before, um, and I'm hoping to one day turn this into a journal article. So if I stop talking about him in papers, maybe that'll encourage me to actually write the thing. But it's important to note that Mackay, in spite of engaging in the all too prevalent anti-Gallic discourse of the time, was himself, was himself of course, a Gael, and no stranger to Highland culture. This likely placed him in a unique position where he both understood Gallic warfare and yet reviled it as a sort of backward and unfair and uncivilised manner of fighting. I should note, however, the hypocrisy in this, as the General Moor, as he's called by his clan, was all too happy to utilise pro-Williamite clan's martial talents and insisted that they should actually be armed and fight in their traditional manner, Ryan, rather than try and force them into European style regiments, as that was what produced the best results when you used, uh, particularly with clans like the Forbes of Culloden, who he used quite regularly, and his own clan like the Mackays of Borley. Regardless, Mackay's knowledge of the bulk of his opponent's forces and Scottish Gaeldom would mean that his preparations for the Fort William expedition were meticulous. He stipulated that the force would consist of 3,000 men, with the Scots-Dutch Brigade acting as the vanguard and rearguard of the force. Each man was to be armed with an up-to-date firelock musket or flintlock musket, 
And believe it or not, even during this period, um, despite what you sometimes hear, the flintlock musket was not prevalent in the arsenal of the Scottish army until the Williamites came to power. Essentially, they spent the entirety of 1689 dealing with outdated matchlock muskets from the middle of the century um, and older sort of style firearms, older artillery. Scotland's arsenal is not in a good state um, and they have to basically buy everything in. Mackay noted, quote, Picks were not useful in those Highland Wars, so he said there, there should be no pikes taken, it should only be firearms, which is one of these major shifts or points to one of these major military shifts. The army were also to be accompanied by 400 pack horses recruited with civilian handlers from the Williamite localities by the government. Now, these pack animals were to carry considerable amounts of ammunition and food needed for the march. Additionally, 2,000 shovels, spades, and pickaxes, along with timbers, these big, long sort of timber deals that would make the walls, were um, to be shipped from Glasgow right up to the Campbell-controlled Dunstaffnage Castle on the west coast of Argyll. And from Dunstaffnage, the ships were then to ferry them further up the coast and up Loch Linney to Inverlochy and Fort. This was in part why the Williamite naval operation had been so important uh, to overawe the clans of the Western Seaboard and paved the way for that resupply that the army would need when they reached the fort. They would only have enough food to get to the fort. They were relying on more food coming. The government in Edinburgh were, however, concerned about the operation. The Secretary of, the Secretary of State for Scotland, Lord George Melville, did not particularly like the expense of the venture nor the prospect of some of the best regiments available to the Williamites marching off into La Cabre. The Williamite ministers were overwhelmingly afraid that should the Irish Jacobite army choose to strike into Scotland, either because of a victory over William of Orange there, or by sheer desperation should they be defeated, Scotland would be left undefended and its west coast taken. Mackay argued that so long as the Jacobites enjoyed the safety of their, quote, hilly confidence and refuge, end quote, they would continue to threaten the Scottish Williamite government, and they were therefore the main threat that should be dealt with, not worrying about a fictitious Irish invasion that was yet to happen. The dispute between Mackay and his political counterparts over what strategy to follow and where to deploy forces was ended when King William made it plain to both sides that he had complete confidence in Mackay and his military strategy. Although post Cromdale, the Jacobite threat has been teleologically discounted or downplayed, it should not be. For the Williamites, the continuation of the Scottish Jacobite clans in arms could not be left alone. It represented a real threat and should the Jacobites regroup and launch another incursion into the Northeast Lowlands, they may have possibly more success, especially considering the exclusion of Episcopalians from the Church of Scotland and increasing discontent surrounding that there. I must say, though, that that support for Jacobitism there was in its infancy during this period. It wasn't quite where it would get to in the 1700s. So to return to this campaign, the course of the Williamite War in Ireland would also play a role in the Williamite campaign in Scotland in 1690, and I'll kind of return to that at the end as I'm wrapping up. On the 18th of June 1690, Mackay led the assembled Williamite field army at Stirling to march for Perth, leaving word to be dispatched to Ferguson's Marine Detachment to make for the head of Loch Linney as soon as possible. Mackay's eagerness to reach Inverlochy was evident when he wrote to the Duke of Hamilton, I intend to make few halts till I be in the rebels country. The Williamite army crossed the River Tay at Dunkeld on the 23rd, and despite delays in procuring rights and pioneers, engineers, Mackay decided to press on through Athol, which had been subdued and garrisoned in the wake of Kelly Cranky in the previous year. The Williamite army were to be met by their forces in the north, the recently triumphant Livingston marching his men from Inverness to meet his Scots-Dutch comrade in the field. Now, Mackay's army could have taken a more direct route toward Badenoch, but Mackay reasoned, uh, Mackay's reason was this, quote, I had not a mind to venture in action till I had joined the forces from the north under Livingston, it being a maxim in our trade without necessity 
to put nothing to an apparent hazard when the success is of great importance, end quote. So this illustrates Mackay is putting his knowledge as a professional soldier trained on the continent to good use, not to engage until the odds were in your favour. It also demonstrates that the Major General had learned a hard lesson from his arrogance at Killycranky, where the Williamites had had a numerical advantage, but had been roundly defeated due to the restrictive terrain, which offered the clans a distinct advantage. Mackay would not engage until it was necessary. Within four days of beginning the march, Mackay and Livingston's forces would meet in Strath's Bay. And if you know Strath's Bay at all, and you can enlighten me on this place name, they met at a place called Colna Kill. I cannot find a contemporary place name for that, but maybe there's some local knowledge out there. So hopefully I can find that out. They then set off toward Speen Bridge, and the army now was 4,000 men strong. Livingston had brought about 1,000 men, both horse and foot commanded by two Scots Dutch veterans, with more of their comrades like Colonel George Ramsey and Colonel George Lauder attending the army. Now, there are two key sources which inform us about the conditions of the march through the course of the campaign, and they don't just come from the upper echelons of the army, such as Mackay's memoir, as good a source as that is, but they come from two soldiers serving within the ranks of the army, or rather, a soldier and an officer. The first was a journal, written by a man called Alexander R. His uh, surname is basically obscured, so we only know the first letter. Um, that journal was discovered and republished by the Glasgow Archaeological Society in the 19th century. Now, it's quite short, but Alexander was a trooper in the cavalry and an experienced horseman able to provide his own mount. He provides an excellent perspective of the campaign, that of an enlisted man within the ranks. He served in the Earl of Eglinton's troop of horse, which means he hailed from around the Earl's lands in North Ayrshire. And as a result, he writes in a very sort of expressive form of Lowland Scots, which makes it very entertaining to read. Although much later on, Alexander goes more into the prices of horses and cattle in his locality rather than warfare and politics, which is interesting, but not so useful for this purpose. The second source is Captain George Carleton's memoir of his military service. Now, Carleton was an English officer who had served alongside the Scots Dutch Brigade previously in the 1670s in Flanders. He had come to Scotland as part of one of those English Williamite regiments we mentioned earlier on, sent to aid their Scottish allies. Now, as Trooper Alexander, as I'll call him from now on, and Captain Carleton began the march toward Loch Aber, the Williamite Naval Squadron had sailed up to Loch Linney and landed Major James Ferguson's Marines at Inverlochy, here at the site of Fort William. The Williamite detachment immediately sought to overawe the Camerons of Loch Keel by seizing Cameron's house at Achnacarry, a pretty bold move considering Cameron was perhaps the most senior Highland commander in the Scottish Jacobite army. However, they entrenched themselves there till General Mackay and his army came up, as uh, Trooper Alexander put it. This daring amphibious raid set up a beachhead for the Williamite forces in the region, and it also guarded against the possible intervention of those French privateers we mentioned earlier. However, the arrival of Ferguson's men and the gathering Williamite forces had alerted and rallied the clans under Cameron of Lochiel. The Jacobite clans of the region basically began gathering under his banner at Glenroy, and they sought to block that route off, hoping to lure the Williamites into battle in the restrictive terrain of the Glens. Additionally, Mackay's approach led them to believe that he would take Glenroy as the shortest route to Inverlochy, hoping that he was running low on supplies and desperate. Mackay wasn't to be uh, taken so lightly, however, as he ordered his men to encamp at the northeastern end of Glenspeen, and then the next day, marching onward, rather than give battle to the Jacobites at Glenroy, chose to make a feint with a rear guard of four troops of horse and four troops of Dragoon posted where the Jacobites expected them. And this ruse worked really well, as the main body of the Williamite army was able to continue marching through Glenspeen toward Inverlochy, leaving the Jacobites in Glenroy kind of not knowing what to do. Now, other local clansmen, however, who had not 
amassed to the army or were on their way, it's unclear which, uh, basically chose to harass the column due to the nature of the terrain and their ability to uh, move over that terrain because of their local knowledge. The size of the army as well also helped them to harass it. Now, this is where Trooper Alexander and Carlton's descriptions inform us of the arduous and frustrating nature of this final stage of the march for the Williamites. Carlton described it as a, quote, most dismal peregrination and recalled that the paths were, quote, so narrow that soldiers could but very rarely go two on a breast and oftener like geese in a string, one after another. It is easy to envisage with such descriptions then, the Williamite army stretching over an extent of many miles through the glen and making a ripe target for small groups of Highland clansmen. Trooper Alexander recalls such attacks, noting that the Jacobites consistently targeted the baggage train at the rear of the column. And these rapid assaults by groups of clansmen had to be beat back by Colonel George Lauder's Scots Dutch Regiment in the rear guard, the attackers losing their, quote, your Highland plaids in the process. Now, these attacks were augmented by the Jacobite sharpshooters utilising probably more accurate hunting firearms than the Williamites were carrying. Carlton's frustration is almost palpable as his memoir describes the accurate sporadic fire, quote, from their summits, they popped upon us always on a sudden. They never stayed long enough to allow any of our soldiers a mark or even enough time to fire, end quote. This long day of marching and harassment and obviously casualties and wounded as well, perhaps results in the only notable uh, skirmish of the campaign uh, as a nameless clan that Trooper Alexander uh, doesn't detail, sought to attack the encamped Williamite army on the evening of the 2nd of July, 1690. Uh, Alexander recalls, quote, Highland man came to the brink of our camp and fired near a hundred shot, which made great alarm, the whole camp standing at their arms all night, end quote. The engagement continued into the morning of the 3rd with an attack on the Scots Dutch vanguard. The Major General Mackay's, uh, sorry, Major Mackay's company engaging first with them, and there was 12 of them, the Jacobites killed and some taken prisoner. This Williamite uh, victory in this sort of small skirmish deterred any further attacks upon the column as they marched into Aknakari and then onward to the site of the old Cromwellian fort at Inverlochy, and of course, the cover of the Royal Navy frigate's artillery. Conditions for the men at Inverlochy, uh, the Williamite soldiers, that is, and their civilian baggage attendants were less than ideal. Provisions were in severely short supply, as Trooper Alexander described the unenviable task he and his comrades now faced to erect the fortification's earthen walls. According to Mackay, it would take 11 days to get these walls to their full height, as men began shoveling and piling earth 20 foot from the bottom of the fosse. Alexander also says, we stayed near a 20 days till such time as the trench was mad up, end quote. Mackay was not entirely satisfied with the position of the old fort. He said, the situation did not please me, being commanded from a near hill, but could not change it, there being none else so fit. There were plans for a great deal of improvement on the fort as well, which you can see here in these last two images. These are later 18th century images. But, uh, or mid 18th century images rather. But these improvements were dropped uh, due to an increasing sense of urgency and emerging issues. Mackay did manage to get a chemin couvert or covered way, which provides access. It's sort of a, a trench in front of, it's a sort of a wall in front of a wall. You can kind of see it here with these little fences around the big stone walls. Um, and then he also managed to construct a glacis which is an incline towards the walls, which allows the defenders a much greater field of fire. But those were the only two improvements he managed to construct. Now, matters were become difficult for a number of reasons. And I'm just about to get to my conclusion as well for the last 10 minutes. Now, firstly, Mackay, faced, uh, Mackay and his army faced severe food shortages, as we've already noted, but also a lack of proper materials to finish the fort. Those naval supply lines that they were so reliant upon were overextended as well. And the Scottish Williamite government's organisation of these was severely lacking. 
perhaps due to the reluctance to fund the venture. The situation had become so dire in terms of supplies that by the 10th of July, Mackay reported many of our baggage men, the civilian handlers we talked about earlier, desert us with their horses, most whereof fall into the hands of the enemy. The supply of meal had run out um, because they had, respect, they had expected resupply by ship. And there were also, to bear in mind, although we've said there were 4,000 soldiers at Inverlochy, Trooper Alexander actually provides a much more, possibly more accurate sentiment or at least an idea of the civilian contractors as well. Um, there could have been close to 8,000 men encamped around this fort, uh, as well as the, the baggage handlers, Ferguson's men, the sailors. Um, so you've, you've got all these men and they all need to eat and it's becoming desperate. Um, secondly, those who know anything about the year 1690 and the Three Kingdoms will know that on the 1st of July, 1690, the Battle of the Boyne took place. And this was important for the Williamite campaign in Scotland. William's Anglo-Dutch army faced off against King James's Irish Jacobite army. And in all, although the Boyne has been viewed as some sort of decisive, glorious victory in certain circles who shall remain nameless, um, it was anything. But as Mackay and his army marched into Inverlochy, the Scottish Williamites and the Jacobites were engaging in a wider propaganda war as to who actually won the Battle of the Boyne. Nominally, the Williamites seized the victory, but the losses they sustained and the retreat of the Irish Jacobite army beyond the River Shannon would see the Williamite war in Ireland continue. The difficulty in communicating with Mackay's army at Inverlochy only increased the worries of the Scottish ministers as they continued to fret about the possibilities of an Irish victory in Ireland. William Carstairs, an advisor to William of Orange, noted at the time that Jacobite rumours abounded of 1,200 men and horse bound for the west coast of Scotland and the possibility of a rising in the Anglo-Scots borders. Now, neither of those events came to pass, but they're serious enough considerations to merit military responses with forces garrisoned around Glasgow and also forces at Berwick bolstered. The 10th of July 1690 brought even more anxiety as the Dutch and Royal Navy fleet was defeated by the French at the Battle of Beachy Head. A letter from George Melville sent from Edinburgh to London on that same day is telling, and I'll just read part of this letter. You may easily judge the disadvantage I am at. The King at such a distance, all intelligence cut off. The strength of our forces in the Highlands where communication is cut. Such a general, and that's Mackay, as would follow no counsel, threatened with an invasion, which the Jacobites are daily, hourly expecting, neither having arms, ammunition or officers, so many disaffected people waiting, but an opportunity to break out and wheel appointed for it. And one of the greatest disadvantage of all, traitors in our bosom. And so that we cannot promise ourselves 24 hours of quiet, end quote. So he's not a happy bunny, to put it lightly. Melville and the other Scottish Williamite ministers demanded Mackay return with his army post haste. Mackay, however, remained resolute as he awaited the arrival of timber to construct the walls so that the garrison could be left in a posture of defence. He emphasised the importance of the post to his masters in Edinburgh. He pleaded, quote, the speedy supplying of this important post. Otherwise, all pains and experiences men have been at Prove, may prove fruitless, end quote. Now, lastly, the weather was turning against Mackay. Campaign season was coming to an end. And as all of us know, as August comes in and then September, we start to get the rains. And so the campaign for Scottish, uh, campaign for Scottish armies is kind of coming to a close, particularly in the Highlands. Um, Mackay rushed to finish the fort. But on the 17th of July, he receives an express that requires him to return to the Lowlands, and he decides to do just that. He dispatches Pottinger and Ferguson to go secure the West Coast and ensure those isles remain blocked up and quiet. He then left the English Colonel John Hill, who, funnily enough, was actually one of the Cromwellian soldiers garrisoned at the Cromwellian Bastion in the 1650s, and also a sort of 
familiar, uh, I wouldn't say friend, but acquaintance of Sir Ewan Cameron of Loch Hill, uh, he left him in charge of the fort with 1,100 men, a, a lot of aquavite, 60 cows, and I think about 500 pounds. The return march for Mackay was without incident. It had none of the skirmishing or harassing that had come before. Um, the Jacobites seemed to know that the game was up with the establishment of the fort. Um, the local Jacobites, at least. They, they then returned, the army returns to the central lowlands and quite predictably suffers an outbreak of the bloody flux, um, probably because of malnutrition and exposure. Um, despite the trials and tribulations, just to conclude, despite the trials and tribulations, the Williamite Offensive had successfully in the establishment of a new fort in the midst of the disaffected Jacobite Highlands. Um, had, had managed to construct this fort. The Scottish Jacobite leadership would fail to convince the Gallic chieftains to venture forth from their lands, as the threat of Williamite garrisons and raids against those lands kept them occupied. They were simply unwilling to leave their homes and livelihoods and families undefended, and nor to ask their men to do the same, um, not without some signal support from King James in Ireland. So the Williamite offensive in Scotland and the Fort William, uh, Fort William expedition cannot be understated in terms of its importance. Although historians from Secchi to Harris have rightfully emphasised that the turning point in terms of a pitched battle was Cromdale, we cannot escape the reality that that dramatic victory had to be reinforced by this um, laborious campaign against the Jacobite heartlands in the Highlands and Islands. The encirclement of the Scottish Jacobite clans was a decisive moment for the Scottish Williamites and brought about a notable shift in the balance of power in their favour. Now that balance of power toward the Williamites had previously eluded them in spite of their major advantages, such as access to public fiscal levers with control of central lowland Scotland and northeast lowlands as well, as, and also their control of the legitimate seat of government. Neither of those things granted them victory from the outset. And the title of this paper, I've posed the question, uh, was this the end of the Highland War? And I think I can answer that, but the conclusion is multifaceted. In military terms, the final year of the Highland War is 1691. But 1690 saw the Williamites gain an unsailed control over the situation in Scotland. And I can say that the Williamite offensive and the expedition to establish Fort William was a deciding factor in their ultimate victory. They were able to pressure the Jacobite chieftains to come to the table through garrisons like Fort William and through military coercion. As early as September 1690, just a month after Mackay had departed Fort William, the former Scots Dutch officer Colonel Richard Cunningham summarised the situation for Lord Melville. My party is stronger than any they can bring to the fields, and this is the only time in the year to ruin their country, just when they have taken in their corns, which is the most part of their subsistence for the winter time. I shall be somewhat troublesome to them blades in their hills if they have anything to lose." End quote. And it's not just the Williamite perspective that offers this type of thing. Major John Bernardi, an Anglo-Italian Jacobite officer and an agent in Scotland uh, in 1690, wrote that it had become incredibly difficult for the leadership to move around the Highlands. Parties were continually almost scouting about the country in the daytime. So these Williamite soldiers are patrolling the countryside now. Even in their former strongholds, um, the Jacobite officers and leadership are struggling to operate with impunity. But the Jacobites held on for another year. The prospect of an uprising by Kenneth Mackenzie, 4th Viscount of Seafort, in the presence of holdouts until 1691 makes that clear. On the other hand, the Scottish Williamites and William of Orange were both satisfied enough that they allowed two regiments of the Scots Dutch Brigade, along with Major General Mackay, to be redeployed to Flanders and Ireland, respectively. Although it is telling that one regiment, the third, was kept in Scotland until the end of the conflict, a fact which only underlines the continued, if diminished, Jacobite threat. Equally important in bringing the Jacobites to the negotiating table in 1691, were wider events, namely in Ireland. After the setback of the Williamite Offensive, the Scottish Jacobites were entirely reliant on a reversal of their ill fortunes to come from abroad. 
and the chieftains' appeals for the Duke of Berwick and an Irish army underline that. This was ended by the decisive defeat at the Battle of Ogram on the 12th of July 1691, which brought about uh, the Scottish Treaty of Alcalader, negotiated shortly thereafter, although the Jacobites did not adhere to the terms of the treaty until, the, until after the Treaty of Limerick in October 1691, which I guess is telling about that hope of foreign support. So just as the Highland War had its origins out with Scotland, so too did its conclusions relate to wider European and uh, um, Atlantic archipelag archipelagic factors. Uh, regardless, the central involvement of the Scots Dutch Brigade, both in the form of Major General Mackay as the main architect of the Fort William expedition and in his use of those regiments in the operation on land and sea, indicate just how central the brigade was to the Williamite war effort and underlines their importance in the Highland War, an importance which has been overlooked. The strategy was ultimately extremely costly, both in terms of manpower and resources for the Williamites, but the fort would pay off in the long run. It was undoubtedly the deciding blow against the Jacobites. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. Fantastic paper, very, very, very vivid as well, in such a period that you know just doesn't get enough Thank you. coverage. Um, I appreciate that. This um, this link here, by the way, is just a link to the map room, the NLS, and these Fort William plans, which include one from 1656, are really interesting uh, to have a look at. So I'd encourage people to, to have a look at that. Super. Right, I'll um, I'll open up the floor to questions if anyone has any. I've got a few of my own, but I'll, I'll hold fire just now. Let someone else get in. Or maybe while they're typing away, I might abuse my host privilege. <laughs> abuse your privilege. Yeah. yeah. Get, get in there while you can. <laughs> I'll, I'll fire one in. I've got a few actually, but I'll, I'll fire one in first. Um, the, the first question I have is about actually the kind of the premise of the Highland War because it's such a understudied and underappreciated period. So many people mm. fall into the trap of thinking, you know, the the Bollymite Revolution is is done and dusted by you know A A A nine. Um, mm -hmm. The actual terminology of the, of the Highland War. Do you feel, given your research on it, that calling it the Highland War almost belittles it because what we're really dealing with is a national civil war here and. Are we yeah. kind of localized and trivialized in something that's actually mm. massively nationally important? Yeah, yeah. The 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 one of the major issues that I've sort of run into in my research is labels. Um, the Highland War is Paul Hopkins' um, sort of adoption. It's, it's his term, um, but it does pop up in Mackay like that quote about pikes um, mentions not useful in those Highland wars, but wars plural rather than you know singular but yeah you're completely right um regionalizing this you know the first shots fired in the highland war are on the streets of edinburgh um as far as my knowledge goes and the raids on perth the raids into the you know the northeast lowlands you can't really confine this to the highlands yet i've i've struggled to come up with a better term that people would quickly identify as not the Jacobite, Scotch Jacobite rising, um, because I think yeah. I have my own issues with calling this just an uprising, because I think that similarly belittles the scale and importance of it to some extent. Yeah. Um, it shouldn't, but it, it sort of does in relation to the revolution. And that political, the hangover from political history in terms of um, the revolution's over by, you know, the passage of the claim of right and then the act for security of the kirk it, it's it's of course not and that's acknowledged by scholars in england and in europe dutch scholars like um like jonathan israel and um, i don't think he's dutch but he works a lot in dutch history yeah. and um he uh his major contention is the revolution is not finished anywhere until 1691 because if scotland folds uh you know that you, you'll know that from the 1640s the covenanters going into england Scotland's capacity to intervene in English politics has been proven before. So this is of, of great importance to William. And 
I think that's why, to me, the Highland War, it, like you say, it's criminally understudied. It's, it's more important, perhaps, than the events of the convention in terms of what's happening on the ground day to day, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, linked into that, normally when people talk about the, the revolution in Scotland or uh, the Highland War, that you come you come across kind of Howden's arguments and, and Tim Harris's arguments, whether, you know, this is mm. reluctant revolutionary action or a will you might mm. coup, but you've got yeah. kind of a unique place to comment upon that, looking at it from the military side of things. So where mm. do you, do you subscribe to either one of those camps or do you think there's something else going on? Um, I try not to really perhaps i'm trying to have my cake and eat it here i try not to subscribe to the these sorts of big arguments because i often think the you know studying a sort of civil war as i as i view this i think they often fall short of the nuances of the situation um i don't think i'm opposed to cowan and um, because i think the idea that the scots are reluctant revolutionaries is a bit of a stretch and um, they voted to get rid of james pretty explicitly as well and it's a majority vote at the end of the day. Um, that's partly to do with the Williamites slick political operation that they deploy in Scotland. Um, propaganda leading up to this. Um, I, I remember having a discussion with Mark Jardin once, and he was sort of saying, you know, we can't, I can't really prove it, but he's saying, I'm sure that there are Dutch arms flowing into Scotland prior to the revolution to certain groups of people. Yeah. I would side more on it being an invasion of England that triggers a political upheaval in Scotland and this sort of interconnected, I guess, going back to Pocock's idea of you can't really talk about one without talking about the other. The invasion of England triggers the collapse of the Scottish regime um, because of the disbandment of the Scottish army and the lack of ability to exert. If you lose political power, if the king leaves Scotland, and leaves you in this position. Your last resort is the military. Um, also, I think as well, some of James's chief uh, government officials are very reluctant to exercise military force against crowds of anti-Catholic rioters in Edinburgh. There's some soldiers putting them down. I think the only real regiment left in Scotland is a, a, a regiment of foot and a sort of detachment of dragoons in Edinburgh. And they're sort of putting down um, rioters and things like that. But it's quite half hearted because, you know, the whole the anti Catholic sentiment's pretty prevalent in Scotland during this period anyway. Uh, and also, they then run into the problem of they can't pay anyone. So they, yeah. they can't pay the soldiers anymore. So you can't rely on them. And um, ironically, William felt that he couldn't trust any of the non brigade regiments in Scotland, which is why the brigade are so central to everything. It's why they're in control. It's why Mackay's commander in chief. Um, I should have sort of thrown this in there. I never really had the time, but Mackay's successors are um, Sir Thomas uh, Livingston, that Scots Dutch officer. So he succeeds Mackay. And so you see that it's almost the prevalence of Scots Dutch officers in the Scottish command in chief role is quite <clears throat> interesting. Uh, yeah. the, the next one, I think, is the the Earl of Leven, who um, was obviously in exile with his father in the Netherlands and was part of the invasion in 1688. So this sort of, almost like a sort of class of 1688, I suppose, these sort mm -hmm. of guys keep popping up. And that's why I kind of want to go more into the Scottish army and stuff like that. But I really think that before I do that, I kind of want to get this this stuff out there, you know? Yeah. I guess there's also like the long term associations as well with you know the Scots Dutch yeah. in the House of Orange go way back mm -hmm. um, in terms mm -hmm. of you know kind of sponsorship and things like that. So no, it's, it's yeah, really yeah, it's it is it's it's fascinating. Um, I think it's it's so it's so interesting as well because up until the revolution, Mackay and most of the other officers, you know, except in maybe some of the Lowlanders, were mostly loyal to James the Seventh. Um, what really changed for them was the birth of a male Catholic heir and then the being put in a position by William of Orange and then kind of saying, well, there's a new war coming. And, and that's how Mackay gets convinced to join yeah. the revolution. Before that, his family are, I think Barbara Mackay's his auntie and she's like a, 
a royalist uh, poet and things like that. So, and some of her boys are in the brigade during the Highland War. So there's this strange sort of changing of loyalties, you know. There's actually so many parallels between what goes on in uh, 8990 and what goes on in the 1640s as well. You know, even these conflicted overlying loyalties of, yeah, I'm loyal mm. to the crown, but I'm also loyal to a Protestant church and, you know, yeah. <laughs> these things are maybe not going hand in hand yeah. anymore. Yeah, um, We do have a little bit more time if anyone does any questions in the, the audience. Um, or I'll just continue to abuse my uh, untapped access. Do you have another question as well? <laughs> so I'll maybe just keep on talking <laughs> until someone puts something in the chat. My my last question that I wrote down when I was I was listening to you there um, is the decision to fortify Fort William or, or in Beloch, Um and obviously the, the, there's the Cromwellian Citadel that you mentioned, but in Mackay's memoirs, is there any explicit reference to a kind of policy to try? And mimic what Monk and Dean do in the 1650s in terms of policing the Highlands? Um, there's sort of allusions to Monk, um, mainly through sort of vague statements about what, you know, an English bastion here, but there's no like explicit, I think there might be one mention of him in there somewhere. Right, okay. My memory's failing me just now. Um, but yeah, obviously this has massive parallels with how the Cromwellians approach the, the Highland problem and then how, you know, Alan Kennedy's research, how restoration governments have approached the problem as well. Yeah. Um, that idea that this is lawlessness rather than, um, you know, like a military conflict can also kind of lead us down a, I don't know, they, they sort of approach it in an odd way. They, they want to diminish their enemies as bandits, but at the same time, um, you know, or Catarans, kind of opportunistic, but at the same time, they're sort of taking it much more seriously than they would otherwise. Um, you know, previous sort of ventures, I don't think have this sort of scale. I know that there was, there were plans during the restoration to reestablish the Cromwellian bastion and to utilize it in this same way. Um, and they're linked uh, into commercial plantation and the idea that, you know, in, in, actual, in actuality, the Fort William's success in 1690 is to establish the fort long term. And that means that Maryborough pops up named after William's wife, Queen Mary. Yeah. So there's this sort of, um, yeah, it's, it's odd. I, can, I don't know if I can really answer it. There's definitely parallels there, but there's no explicit sort of like, lifting from it from what i can see there might it's just yeah just when you were talking there it's just so interesting because um what what's happening there by the sounds of it and what definitely happens in the 1650s is um almost an attempt to contain the highlands rather than try and control it so it's not mm -hmm. what they're trying to do with like fort augustus you know um, yeah, later yeah. on it's you, you've got inverlochy or fort william mm -hmm. you've got inverness and then yeah. you have garrisons in Glasgow and, and yeah, uh, yeah. Perth. And you basically yeah. hem it in, right? Yeah. So yeah. I just I was wondering if I that think, was I a, think you know. That's it. You've, you've hit the nail on the head. It's a containment strategy. And the Williamites yeah. are doing the same thing. They don't want to exert complete military control over the Highlands. I think Mackay, better than anyone, understands that you can't do that. Um, but I think what he what he wants to do in the short term is exert enough pressure on these areas to force them to the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. um, the the Williamites, I, ne I never really got to put this in, but the Williamite ministers, um, Lord George Melville and the Viscount of Tarbert uh, sort of come up with proposals to bribe the clans. That's often one of these that'll fix it sort of strategies. Yeah. Um, they, they come up with this after Killy Cranky when they've lost confidence in Mackay and Tarbert particularly exploits it because he's previously been a sort of crypto Jacobite sitting on the fence and then he comes into the King's Peace uh, judging the Williamites to be the winning horse and that might be unfair to Tarbert but I think what 
he's doing is trying to make himself really useful and offer this strategy as a kind of compliment to Mackay, but Mackay sees it as an as a challenge ultimately. Um and he's sort of uh he's quite angry about it because there's no indication that the clans, the Jacobite chieftains would accept uh, any sort of monetary inducement to lay down arms. If anything, they just use it as a delaying tactic um, while they wait for more arms um, or reinforcements from Ireland. But yeah, that exertion of military control, I should make clear, is not to, it's the same type of deal, is to contain it within a certain area and then to put pressure on those areas to come to the negotiating table, which is ultimately what happens at the Treaty of Alcalader. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's obviously a lesson they don't learn from the forties and fifties. Is when you give loyal clans money, they, it often goes towards buying things that they point at you later on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I should I should say that the thing with the Highland War is this is um although this is a Williamite victory, um just to add the kind of nuance to it, but you know it, it was um it's not a long term victory. The clans are still. The Jacobite clans still remain mostly in post. Um, I think even you and Cameron of Lochiel uh, has the cheek to suggest he should be a justice of the peace in 1693. Uh, but then also at the same time, his third son serves in the Scots Dutch Brigade as well, alongside Mackay's son. So mm. enemies in the same group, you know, like they're just that's it. You know, this is where the opportunities are now. Yeah. We've got a question from Derek there in the chat. Um, any thoughts why there was no move to move further north to complete the stranglehold rather than just containing from the Great Glen southwards? It's a good question. Um, so during this period, uh, the clans of the north tend to be more Williamite. Not all of them, of course, but there are big dominant clans in the north that are supportive of the Williamite cause. Uh, the Mackays are obviously one. Um, but also towards that end of the great, you know, that great glen, you get the the Forbes of Culloden, um, the Grants, although the Grants are split down the middle, and then the Gordons as well are sort of split. So they're fighting amongst themselves as well as also with the Williamite government. So that sort of, um, and I have to say, uh, uh, you know, um, I've got a lot of issues with Mackay, you know, it's it, he's not a He's not often a likable person. Uh, he's an interesting figure, but I think we can be, you know, you always have to be careful studying these types of guys because you know, they're, they're men of violence and things like that. But he, he has a sort of masterful stroke in terms of he immediately identifies, because he's from the North Highlands, the usefulness of those clans and starts funneling commissions and money towards them to act on William's behalf, basically to police their own areas. Um, and that's why he's also so keen for this offensive in June 1689, because the clans in the north are coming under pressure from the Jacobite army, because the Jacobites are operating with impunity um, up mm -hmm. and down the Great Glen. And so they're striking into the northern parts of the highlands um, and also maybe striking on the coasts and striking shipping and all sorts of stuff. So they're, they're, they're raiding Williamite lands and they're raiding Williamite clans with impunity. And obviously Mackay, as, you know, as a person from that sort of area, is keen to stop that as soon as he can. Um, and that's what they try and do with June 1690. So that's maybe why they didn't try and have control over those areas, because they had supporters in those areas who could exert control on their behalf. Same thing in Argyll. You know, there's some troops that get sent to Argyll but they're largely, de you know, they're, they're happy to be dependent upon the Campbells because, you know, the Campbells can provide a regiment and then use their own clansmen as well to like shore up the gaps in the Western seaboard. Um, it's the little bits like Kintyre that are always the worried, the worried yeah. bits, um, which is really, really interesting because, you know, obviously you learn doing a PhD, you learn so much about it, but learning about like the McAllisters of Loop and things like that and their their rivalry with the Campbells was really interesting. Yeah. I think most people have a rivalry with the Campbells at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It seems that way. I've got a list of every clan and I'm kind of like, yeah, I think most of those clans. 
<laughs> they don't win any popularity contests in the 17th century anyway. No, no. I think as well, to sort of come back to, to sorry to jump in there, but to sort of come back to that, the, the, your first point about downplaying this, there's sometimes also, you see this in historiography occasionally, it tends to be older stuff, but there is this sort of downplaying of it, of, oh, it's regional Highland yeah. politics. It's anti-Campbell sentiment that drives Jacobite support. Whether or not that's true, it doesn't really matter. It's still Jacobite support at the end of the day, but you can see that kind of coming in as well, that downplaying yeah. of the Highlands and as an important national political sphere, you know? Again, that's exactly what happens in the 1640s. Um, and a mm. lot of the kind of historiography scholarship attached to that. Um, so I would, I would mm. completely agree with that. Um, I am conscious just of the time. Uh, so unless I see another question pop up, um, just in case anyone is furiously typing away on a, on a keyboard. Okay, I'll, I'll guess not. So um, before I bring matters to a close then, can I just ask that everyone joins me in the uh, traditional awkward virtual round of applause for uh, Dr. Milne's fantastic <laughs> paper and his uh, generosity in discussion. Thank you very much, Graham. Thank you guys. Thank you for having me. Hopefully next time I'll be in Orkney, you know, uh, we can, we can yes, deal with this in person. Absolutely. Bye. Oh, then I can like corner you in a pub somewhere and ask even more questions. <laughs> um, or I'll so corner you. They'll probably go back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all that's left for me to do tonight is to warmly invite everyone back here for our final uh, seminar of the term, which will take place on the 24th of November at 7 o'clock, with a paper from our very own Dr Annie Tucson, uh, who will be presenting on the topic, Developing the Visitor Appeal of Orkney's Norse Heritage Sites, A Route to More Sustainable Tourism? Question mark. But until then, thank you all for attending. Thank you again to Graham for presenting, and we'll see you all next month. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks.